What's up, what's up, what's up? I'm Brand Man Sean. And I'm Corey. And we are back with episode number 19 of No Labels Necessary. Catch us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, wherever you listen to podcasts, watch videos, all that good stuff. We there. So go check for us. Now, no labels necessary. What do we mean by that? No labels are necessary for us to do what we want to do, build our dreams, make happen what we say can happen. Artists, it's not an excuse. But also, no labels, you can't box us in. We're going to talk about multiple topics on this podcast. So some of y'all get a little little itchy when we don't talk directly. But trust me, it all comes full circle because when you really have these industry talks, this is how they go. Mm -hmm. So let's get into the first topic. It's advice, baby. Rate that advice. I want to play an old school clip, old school player, player coming with some advice that is still relevant today. He's speaking to y'all kids in the future, and I'm one of them kids. Now, <laughs> Jacory, you have not seen this yet, no, so new. I want you to comment on it first. Check out these words of wisdom for from none other than Barry White. Very lucrative business. It's the only business where a man can go to sleep tonight poor and wake up tomorrow a rich man. What is going to happen to the new artists coming in? They're going to have to come in with a different philosophy. They can't just come into this business as a singer. They got to come in with the intentions of becoming a great singer, becoming a great songwriter, becoming their own record producer, become, learning what the management business is, learning what engineering is. If it's possible, they can become a musician. Fine. We are dealing with your life. A lot of people play with this record business, man. They use this glamour as a beautiful little bubble to flash in front of the outer world. But that bubble is very dangerous. You should come in very serious, knowing that this is my livelihood. What about business administration? What about publishing? What about accounting? What about management? There is many, many lucrative entities in this industry. The record business is... Man, he called it, bro. What, you know, uh, you know where you're this clip is from? Hey, bro, I'm so glad you asked me that question, <laughs> man. I literally looked up when did this man pass away? Unfortunately, just to get a context of like when this clip could be from. Yeah. All right. So Barry White died in 2003. All right. Now, no, I don't know when that clip is from. But if I pull this clip back, look at that glow. People didn't stop glowing like that in the 80s. So I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's probably about 88, something like that. <laughs> Niggas ain't out here glowing like that no more, bro. <laughs> oh, man, that's funny. But, I mean, it's it's funny that in 88, he already saw it, bro. He was like, yo, right. artists in the future, in order to compete, you're going to have to learn how to do everything. Or have, at least have a vested interest in trying to figure out how to do everything. Yes. And it's funny that he saw that coming. Cause yes. I, I feel like we really only saw it coming because of the uh, internet. Yeah, the internet and like the burst of artists, but it's funny that he saw that without any of that. You know what I'm saying? Bro, that's my first question. Yeah. I would love to be able to speak with him and say, what are you seeing that's making you say this? Yeah. You know what I mean? And I'm sure he had the context of before and then the advancements that was happening in the 80s and 90s, whatever. But like, what were you seeing that made you say this? Yeah. You know? Um, cause we, we know we're, we're aware that a lot of these things that we think are new, like phone texting your fans or calling your fans and those personal relationships. And some of these things are not as new as we think. All right. Yeah. Like there are people who are doing a lot of similar things back then, building our fan relationships through different pop-ups and all that, that cool stuff. We just rebranded how we market it. Right. Yeah. But still, I'm just like having to do everything in the way he was promoting it. Like, I mean, it was like, it's a, low key, he was going harder on doing everything than we go. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like and I'm, right I'm, and I mean, we collectively today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I think he said, if you could be a musician, do that. Like, he said it as like a ma- after thought. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, if you yeah. could be good at music too, like, or, well, I don't want to say music, be a good musician, like actually playing music too. Like, that's fine too. Yeah. But that wasn't a priority. And a lot of times when we think back, to those times, we kind of assume all those things were a must. So, yeah, man, I think uh, obviously the advice is obviously key and more relevant than ever. But, but sheesh. It can be applied to so many other things. Yes. So many other things. Yes. I, I like that it's a clip of someone like him saying it because I think that the misconception is that a lot of those artists would be like purists if we like brought them here today. Yeah. Right? They'd be like, they'd be 
fighting the great fight of like artists just staying artists. But nah, bro, it sounds like Barry White would be right on the front line. Like, hey, bro, you gonna have to get up and make that TikTok. It is what it is. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, get your ass out the bed, bro, and go hey. do what you gotta do. Yeah. And I like, I like, I like having proof. I like having proof that they would think that way. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> man. And I love that he just said, "This is your life." Yeah. What are you gonna say to that? Yeah, exactly, bro. Like all that. This is how music should be. I'm an artist, and I should just be able to make it. All right, bump that. Like people may care about your artistry, but you definitely should care about your life. Yeah. Because that's all it is. Like when we dissect all this stuff, all of our decisions, it comes down to the fact: this is our life. Do I want to work at all? If I get a job, what type of job do I want? If I have a career, what kind of career do I want? What type of artist? If I if I am a musician, do I want to be? Yeah. It's still essentially a lifestyle that we're building for ourselves and the way we want to go about things. So yeah. not, are we going for that or not? And the energy he gave is, ain't nobody giving that to you here. Yeah. <laughs> we go for it around here. We, we go for it. For, yeah. <laughs> now, I, I, I really I really love that energy, bro, that he was giving in this, in this video, but even more so, I felt like, I don't know, man. I just felt I, I don't even. I don't want to say inspired or anything. It was just, it was like a reaffirming, but on a whole another level because of the context of mm-hmm. where he comes from, how old this clip is, and I still like we got to get some old schools on here, man. When we start actually talking, people doing interviews and stuff like that, we got to get some some people who were around back then. You know what mm-hmm, I mean? Yeah. And, and see what that looks like, what they were complaining about. Like I want to talk to Patty LaBelle, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Patty, you want to give us some free pies, you know. I would love that. You're cooking. I I love to eat. I eat too much, but I'll still break my diet for you, Miss Patty. Um, but but yeah, man. He he was he was giving the game. So I mean, those my thoughts are pretty short cuz it it was just so perfect, but <laughs> I just realized they wrote new advice. New artist advice. Oh, okay. No, now I get is advice for a new artist. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> Never mind. Never mind. I recant what I was about to say. But um, yeah, man, the importance of looking at this as your life of business and all of those elements being a part of your responsibility, whether you become the person who can do it or you at least being the short ensuring someone. No, at least, oh, golly, I messed that up. Either Whether it's you being the person who does it or you ensuring that someone else does it, mm-hmm. or you hiring in some, somebody else that ensures they do it, and you ensuring that they do their job, it's still your responsibility at the end of the day because this is your life, yep. period. Period, period, period. No matter how you slice this shit, who's doing wrong, who's doing right, I don't think there's any greater responsibility just to look at it, this is my life, and then how do I want to build my path? So I love that. That's not even like super music tactical. It just kind of is what it is, and yeah. you leave it at that. Yeah, I agree, bro. This is exactly that. It is what it is. This is what you got to do. Go do it. Hey, so what are you going to do in terms of the rating? Rate that advice. We want to know what y'all think out of 10, you know, 7 out of 10, 5 out of 10. But, Corey, what you got for this advice? I mean, you know, he might be. He might be potentially family, man. So I'm gonna give him a nine. Potentially family? What you? What you mean? What you? Oh, mean? my dad's side. Uh, my last name White over there. Y'all so got he, some whites over yeah, there. We got some whites over there. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what I'm saying? Maybe, man. Yeah. You know, maybe. But uh, no, nah, that's solid advice, bro. Nah, because like I say, it's scary how much it translates to today. Yeah. It's like, yeah, yeah, like yeah. it could only have been scary if he was like, no TikTok. You guys need to make them TikTok. <laughs> that's bro. all that was missing. Bro, I would have lost it, bro. I was like, oh shit. <laughs> Oh man! Hey, well, shout out to the whites, man. You know, <laughs> got Barry in your family. You got the Barclays. You got Charles in your family. I'm out here, bro. You, you got I'm an industry plan, bro. I'm trying to tell y'all, bro. <laughs> industry plan. Hey, he hiding in plain sight. Y'all think he playing? Y'all think he playing? He's serious. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next topic, man. We got some some sauce from the Brandman Network community. Just another great conversation. Again, for y'all who do not know, Brandman Network is a community. That's free for the artist out there. Mm-hmm. Um, we have these conversations here, but this is where we get into the details, not just through conversations with, with by, um, through what I'm about to talk about right now, but also through legitimate classes, information that walks you step by step. So when you want to step by step, the exact strategies we use as an agency, all that stuff's free inside of here, but you got to join um, and we're not letting everybody in. So it's better to try to get in sooner than later. Now, what is the question? I don't know how to say this name. I want to shout you out, but I'm going to just call you Jay Quito. You know what I mean? 
Now, the question is, what to do when labels reach out? And I want to get into this conversation. Let me pull up the right tab. There we go. Hi, guys. I have some labels reach out to me to have a meeting and possibly get signed to them. I'm pretty new to all of that. I was wondering if anybody else has advice on what to do when labels reach out. And are they are there any red flags I should be looking out for? All right. Ty Townsend said, hey, don't have advice, particularly on the above. <laughs> but wanted to say I'm feeling what you did for what you mad for that's one of his songs i assume shout out to dang i wish i could say your name but what you mad for shout out to you for having a dope track to people in in the network mess with now albert johnson jr says i was approached by an indie label back in 2020 but it was such a wild situation they ended up breathing their i think he meant to say breaching they ended up breaching their own contract because they were harassing me about switching all of my previously released work under their publishing with BMI. Well, I would say because I didn't know anything or had anyone to have anybody talk to at the time, make sure that they're not trying to get credit for everything you've already released. Right. So he's saying you've done things before you got in the agreement with them. Make sure that they're not trying to get ownership of all of that stuff as a part of your agreement, or at least if they are, y'all need to talk about that. Right. Next thing that Albert Johnson Jr. said And if they're asking for your masters off rip, that's a red flag. All right. Might be obvious to some of y'all, but just wanted to say. Now, let's stop there because we know there's more dope conversation in this space. But with that alone, Ja'Cory, what do you think about the advice that Albert gave? And then are there some other thoughts and signs that you feel like people should take into account when labels reach out? Yeah, I think Albert's, Albert's, let me read it real quick. Yeah, Albert's Albert's, uh, comment was legit. So, I mean, I think it's, it's about breaking it down into steps, right? And I think that if a label reaches out to you, one of the first things you should do is research. And one, just look into that label and make sure, hey, is, is this label legit? Yep. Is the person that's reaching out to me from the label legit? Um, you can do this through a number of ways, right? Like LinkedIn, like look up people on LinkedIn, Google the person's name and the label name and see if any articles any references come up that are around that person but like just do research and make sure that this person this entity is someone that's worth you talking to and they're offering you a serious a serious um situation so with that being said i'm assuming we're going to move through the rest of the conversation assuming this is a legit label that's reached out to you right. to talk to you um i think the very first thing you need to do is just take the call like take the, have a conversation with them because every label person is different the way they're going to kind of approach things is going to be different. But I, I personally believe that you don't start to see how seriously someone is thinking about you and their situation until you get a chance to actually have a conversation, right? Not saying you have to go into it with any expectation that there'll be something that happens at the end of it, but like just having it just to see how this other person talks to you or talks about you or just kind of where their head is at, right? Why did they even reach out to you? Oh, we saw X, Y, Z and we thought you were cool. That right there, bro. Like that's the biggest thing why I think everybody should have a conversation. Yeah. Right? Because when you talk to these people, you're going to learn what they look at. Yep. Right? What they find to be interesting about you and just hear other elements in the game that you might not be accustomed to or you might have heard on paper, but you don't see how it acts. Um, is executed in conversation, right? It's a completely different flow and part of the game to get used to. And then you talk to multiple people. If you are in a position where multiple people are calling you, then you can start looking at commonalities between conversations Mm -hmm. and piecing things together and involve your perspective on things from there. Yeah, exactly. I feel like that's the biggest key. Like Even if nothing comes out of the situation, you have a a better understanding of how these people move for the next time you get into the situation or the, the next neighbor that reaches out. So it's like, Every conversation you have strengthens your defense of getting finessed, you know what I'm saying, ideally, because either yeah. you're taking enough information to at least know, like, the right questions to ask the next person you talk to, right? At the very bare minimum, like, you should learn enough from call A that by the time you get to call D, you already got a list of things you're going to ask to kind of, like, feel the situation out, right? Right. Um, but then on top of that, I think also, too, just, like, being normal in the situation is, is very underrated, right? Like, I see artists get these label calls, and I just... Throw every fucking thing out the window, bro. All the the rhetoric they've been talking for the last <laughs> couple of weeks goes out the window. They're talking about doing things they would never typically do. Wait, hold on, hold on. I need you to be detailed because I don't want people to miss what you're saying. Like, what do you mean when you say, like, they're talking about things they never would talk about or do things they never would do? 
Are you talking about the label side or the artist side? Artist side. Okay. Like, so I, I remember we had a situation with a client where the label was telling them to like, they might have to take their music down or something, mm -hmm. right? And like this person was seriously considering doing it because mm -hmm. the label told them to do it. And we were like, well, bro, you ain't even signed nothing yet. One, you know what I'm saying? Like, so that's crazy. Mm -hmm. And then two, like, no, they're wrong in the situation for how it benefits you. They're right for how it benefits them, but they're wrong in how it benefits you. You know what I'm saying? Facts. And so, but I think a lot of artists just are willing to be super compromising out the gate without even like one, just saying if, if they're serious. And then two, like understanding like what could happen if they do follow the direction of this person who, to be fair, does not yet have your best interest at heart. They have no reason to have your best interest at heart. You ain't signed nothing yet. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, I can sell you the dream and it sounds good, but like, who knows if this is the dream I want to sell you once the ink drops, right? That dream, I completely switch up. I got you. Now this is what the real shit is about to go down. You know what I'm saying? Hey. So I think just like being normal in those situations, not not switching up too much, but then just like talking to them like they're people, you know, because I do also think all right, as, as artists, you go into a lot of these conversations looking at the other person as almost like a savior, especially a and R's, but A&R's, managers, are to some degree as marketers, we get that, bro. We all get the starry eyes, bro. They staring at you and you just see all their hopes and dreams being projected onto you. You know what I'm saying? That's a scary feeling to be on the other side of. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, you know, superstar exec or not, bro. That's a, that's a scary That's a scary feeling to have that. those eyes looking back at you. So I think even going to this situation like, hey, this is a, another human being. Like we mentioned on another call, bro, this is just a person doing a job, right? And understanding that and knowing that like, I'm not gonna treat this person any differently because of their title necessarily. I think one is 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 empowering in a sense because people can smell like desperation on you, bro. You you've been too nice, you 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 move in a certain way. Like I can smell desperation or two, which I think is worse, smell that you have not been in this situation before, right? Like you've been too friendly on the car, bro. You've been too talking, oh bro, I've been looking up you for XYZ amount of years and I think right like you like moving in ways of like if I'm an A and R that's had a hundred conversations with artists this week who are maybe a little bit higher than you, like they they all go a certain way. Very concise, you know what I'm saying, maybe to the point, you know what I'm saying? Not too much sugar coating, maybe versus, you know, newer artists, like it's gonna be a lot of sugar coating because I can tell this is your first time being in yeah. a situation. I'm not trying to scare you away from what could be, you know, my career changing opportunity. You know what I'm saying? I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna string you along through the lines the way that I know people like you can be can be strong along. You know what I'm saying? Just be yeah. real, you know what I'm saying? Like just be hundred percent. So I think um, yeah, like one thing is just like not to get out of the habit of that. But yeah, the first step I say is like take the conversation, like talk to them, mm -hmm. see what they want from you, ask them what made them reach out to you. You know, like you said, get an understanding of of what breadcrumbs they follow to get to you. And and because in that you'll learn like where your leverage points are at, right? Like you, somebody might say like, "Man, yeah, bro, I I, I wanted to reach out to you because like, bro, I think your, I know your YouTube content strategy is like killer, bro. Like, shit, you doing better than all the new acts we've talked to this week? You didn't know that, you know what I'm saying? So they said that, bro. Now you know, like, okay, hmm, they really like my my content infrastructure. That seems to be a selling point. And apparently, I'm doing better than X amount of the new motherfuckers that's coming in, right? New information that you would not have had, new content you would not have had if you had you not taken the conversation. So I think that's the most important first step. Take the conversation. Set that up as fast as you can. There doesn't have to be any stipulations. There doesn't need to be a specific outcome. But it's like, just try to have the conversation as fast as you can have the conversation. I'm with that 100%. Yeah. 100%. And we can get into another comment in the space. Adrian Milanio says... I have had labels reach out at every stage of my career, 1,500 followers, 10K followers, 30K, et cetera. The types of deals and interest has varied for me. I've done a few deals where labels have provided advances, marketing support in exchange for royalties percentages. In my opinion, I think it's better to keep building until you don't need a label and can leverage better deals. Now, just with a little context, I'm not, not going to go too deep into adrian's situations but on one occasion right he had a singles deal and i only mention a singles deal to help artists understand that yo man like there's so many different variations of deals so a lot of times we think signing to a record label means yeah. i don't know a 360 every single time giving up the whole damn shit yeah right or give less of the shit because you really negotiated well right yeah but there's so many variations of where income can come from, where income can't come from, what what's owned. So you 
could just make up some shit like, hey, man, you get 50% of my mas- masters and nothing else. I don't know. Or you could say you get uh, 20% of my merch and 50% of my masters and I don't know, 0% of my touring or 5% of my touring. Like All of this stuff can vary and it's up to you to get creative. And it comes both ways from a standpoint of what's the value of these people? in my eyes and of course what value do they see in you or can they bring to you as skill still from your perspective that's what you you care about the most so a singles deal i think is a good way for many artists to see how much labels don't do oftentimes Mm -hmm. right and it's lower commitment because you're not fully in that relationship it's only one song locked up you still have an entire catalog if that song continues to move and takes off then you now have new attention that's being brought to your other music, your yeah. brand, et cetera, yeah. right? And that's ideally, though, right? The reality is they can get locked up for the, they can lock you up for that one song and not do shit. Yeah, hundred percent. And that just suck. Yeah. <laughs> that's the reality of it. But the whole dream is, oh, I'm only giving them ownership of one song or partial ownership of one song or sharing my royalties for this one song. And when it blows up, I'm going to have a big name and the rest of this goes into this catalog that I got so much attention for. That is the ideal scenario. Yeah. Right. But both sides is, hey, well, the song actually got zero gains. Only my work that I've continued to do has brought attention to it. But what they've done hasn't really get done much for me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. You know, it's a it's an ebb and flow to that and how you approach it. So I'm not saying, hey, just because someone's offering you a singles deal, it's a no brainer. You should do it. You still have to get into stipulations like my marketing budget. What is that if I do get a marketing budget? And what does that look like? Because a label will say you have a marketing budget, but when you actually go to work with them, you don't get tapped into any of that budget. Right. Oh, yeah, we have a 50K marketing budget for you, but we have to approve every little thing and every little bit of spend for this marketing budget. Right. So whatever your system was beforehand, I have to approve it. Or maybe you didn't have a system, but you want to do some stuff. I now have to approve every bit of that spend and I'm going to be scrutinizing. Maybe I'm more flexible to the stuff that is actually paying me because you can use my studio or use my content creator, use my agency, whatever that looks like. And then I'll say, don't do any of this other stuff. Mm. Right. Or maybe I'm just super tight with the purse strings of how I spend the budget. And I don't have enough of a vision and understanding of current marketing to be able to say, yes, that's a good move. And no, that's a bad move. Yeah. So now I'm not approving things you should do. And I've seen many times where an artist will have a 50K marketing budget and they don't see 10K of it. Yeah. All right. A 200K marketing budget and they only see 100K of that 200K and the agreement's over and they just never see it ever. (laughs) But they come in with this idea. This is my marketing budget. This is how much money. So there has to be additional stipulations. One of what actually getting that marketing budget looks like. All right. Not, oh, y'all just spend it. But hey, how much of that do I get to take and spend based on my own discernment? But then two, what are the specifics in general? Like, again, not just what I get, but how does getting it look? Yeah. Period. Right. Not what you're going to do or can do, but under what circumstances you're going to give it to. And then the last thing is that vision again, right? How close can y'all get in terms of the vision that you want to achieve, right? And how much are they not only aligned with that, but understand the type of marketing that makes sense for you as an artist? Because if y'all are on the same page there, it's still going to come back to the same thing. Y'all are button heads. And, even, and look, both ways could actually be something that worked, yeah. but they want to go about it in a different way. So I know it sounds like way more detailed and nuanced than you would think when it's saying, when it comes to what should I do when a label reaches out? But that's all the type of stuff that you're actually looking for. And the more detailed that you're asking some of these questions, the more people start to understand, it's like, oh, this person is somebody who's serious and we're not, we can't just throw can't, shit at them. can just fuck them over, bro. Just can't yeah. fuck them over. So look at that, bro. It's like, have the conversation, ask some questions, have another conversation, get some terms, get a lawyer. <laughs> get a lawyer. Get a lawyer, bro. Like, literally, just lawyer. In that, that's what the four or five step process. Right. Hey, well, look. 
get a lawyer is probably number one advice. However, make sure that lawyer is not the label's lawyer. Make yeah. sure that label's not one of the home, that lawyer's not one of, you know a homie of somebody in some kind of way. All those things. You know, we think it's obvious, but, you know, there's people who are different parts of the ladder. Yeah. So make sure that lawyer is, you know, fresh and fit for you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's, that's why I said like later, because I, I don't think one is needed until like terms are presented. But the moment it, like it's like if we just oh, having yeah. a conversation. Facts. Yeah, you don't need one. Right. We just talking. But once like terms are presented, hey, I think you will look great in this deal. Lawyer, lawyer up. Yes. Don't even know. I, I once had a... Um, uh, one of my manager homies, I remember they was doing a ghost shading with a label, and he, I, I always remember, like, because I, I always thought it was so funny that he said this shit, but they sent him some contract, and he couldn't understand it. And they was about to get a lawyer. They, ended up, they did end up getting a lawyer, so it, it worked mm -hmm. out. But I remember he told the label, he was like, send me this contract like you're sending it to a third grader, and if my third grader cousin can't read this, I'm not reading, I'm not signing nothing. Mm -hmm. And they did it, bro. They went back and took this like 30 page document and condensed it into like four or five pages, bro. It was very, it was crazy, bro. I didn't, I didn't think they was going to do it. They really wanted his artist, you know what I'm saying? So hey. they was willing to make it work. And then he took that to the lawyer and then the lawyer did his thing from there. But, you know, so it's like, bro, you, you know, you can ask for shit, bro. That's really it, bro. Ask questions, have the conversation, and then lawyer up. And what I like about that last part that you just said, because yeah, that that was always <laughs> funny to me that that happened, but it's it's real. You want to make it as simple for you to understand as possible. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think growing up, you tend to think when it comes to contracts, you almost expect it to be so complex mm -hmm. and out of your league that when you encounter a complex contract, you think something's wrong with me. Cause I don't understand this shit. Not something's wrong with them. Yeah. But you need to be thinking something's going on there. How can I simplify this as much as possible? Again, still want to get that lawyer mm -hmm. at the end of the day. But how can I get this to a point where it makes as simple as sense to me as possible? So yeah, one hundred percent. Anything like that? Hey, can you simplify this? Can you explain this? What's going on here? Your lawyer's gonna help with, with that. But I love the just hey, yo, take the whole contract <laughs> and shorten this shit. Like, I've, this shit I've heard simple. the other. Like this shouldn't be longer than X number of pages. Mm -hmm. All right, when people do stuff like that, anything that that helps you out, because a lot of times there's a lot of superfluous information. In yeah, these things. It's not trip you up with words, man. In <laughs> perpetuity for continuity of the universe. You're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> the universe, bruh. The and universe. beyond. That's the bruh. The universe shit is why I didn't sign that contract when um who reached out to me. I don't know if it was NBC or Wall Street Journal. So they were doing uh, a Dominic Fike series. New York mm -hmm. Times was, right? And I don't know who the company, if it was them specifically or the company doing the doc or whatever. Yeah. But they hit me up. They wanted to use part of my Dominic Fike video in there. And, you know, I'm like, oh, that's dope. That's a good look. I ain't trying to make money out of it or none of that like that. But I just couldn't at the time with the perpetuity and the universe aspect of it. Yeah, you know what I mean? I'm like, I don't know where my career is gonna be is gonna be in 20 years. I might decide to become a politician or something. You know what <laughs> I mean? Uh, like a, a run for election, whatever, whatever. And then all of a sudden, they got the, the ability to use this and all these different platforms. It might flip it somehow. I I told the lady, hey, I would just like it to say y'all can use it for this show, this series, and. Any formatting of this series, I understand that whenever mm -hmm. you use it anywhere else in any other way, you still want to be able to use that because you don't know what you're going to do with the series. But nah, I can't just have it languished where you own this content or can use this content for anything beyond this series. And I don't know what that is. To me, that was just a weird thing. And, yeah. you know, she was like, oh, man, you know, yeah, I'll send that back. So it was like, dope. She sent that back. But then, of course, the people end up going a different direction. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it was just a different creative direction. You know, people who were less resistant, possibly. Yeah. You know what I mean? We don't yeah. need to have these problems or potential problems, which I get. I respect that at the end of the day. And I was like, dang, you know, that sucks. But I don't know. You know, you kind of just <laughs> have to take that shit on, your, on the chin. And I actually say that same thing when it comes to labels. If you feel like you missed out on an opportunity, but it came from you trying to be diligent. Mm. 
you just got to take it on the chin and let that feeling ride because it might feel weird for a second and you might feel like, oh, when's the next one coming? But you yeah. good. You'll be all right. Yeah, you'll be all right. You'll be all right. Be more, more opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> They're coming. They're coming. Now, let's see. The Jermaine Gum said, depending on if you have any leverage, if you do, keep your masters and if possible, your publishing. If possible. Hey, big on that, if possible, and I understand why they they like they like the comfort of publishing. We know that's that's where the money is. Ooh, there's a clip I want you to see. But if you don't have any leverage, you most likely won't even get a 50 50 deal. Most likely, you'll only get around fifteen percent for your music. For example, which most people don't know, Bruno Mars when he had the hit out called "That's What I Like," he was only getting around fifteen percent off that song. I found that out when I was being taught in Berkeley College of Music in Music Business One Hundred and One. So please be careful, man. Mm. I mean, that's a nice comment. That's a nice comment. I didn't know that about uh, about uh, Bruno. Yeah, I actually, same. just realized I corrected that because he wrote Bruno. But uh, <laughs> let's let's read a couple other comments. Let me see. Nate James said, "Just be wary of label execs, bro. Any label that would throw 10k at an artist to see if they go anywhere." <sighs> Oh, okay. He said anybody, any label will throw 10K at an artist just to see if they go anywhere. And if they don't, then they can just dump you and move on. Make sure you're ready and then hire a good music lawyer to make sure you aren't getting taken advantage of. Now, yes, it is a part of many labels business model, 100% to put in a small investment. Pump and dump. <laughs> uh, pump and dump 100 see that bad boy go if it don't go hey we keep moving and i think this is the catch 22 of these artist friendly agreements yeah. that we see today where it's like oh yeah six month licensing deal one year licensing deal or whatever with an option what we basically saying is hey i'm gonna give you 10k 20k whatever the number is and that's the number I already worked out in my investment strategy. Mm-hmm. If it worked, cool. If it don't work, it's not great, but I'm good, right? Yep. Yep. So this is the money I'm going to put in. There's an opportunity here. If things pop, I have the option. That's the biggest thing. People, artists be saying, you know, I got an option in my contract. No, nah, this ain't sports, bro. Like, and even in some sports, it's different. But you don't have an option. They got an option yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to say, do you stay, do you go, right? So- they have that option. Oh, if this works, let's keep working, yeah. right? Or if I, for whatever reason, want to keep you locked down, even if it's to screw you over, let's keep keep working, quote unquote, keep you under contract. But other than that, you lose whatever period of time on your end. What else do you have to lose? I mean, the deal, if it really does work out, it's great, you know, um, depending on what you have. But let's just assume you're, it's only a royalty agreement. You don't have to give up any up, up of your masters, anything like that. And you did a, let's say, what would be a number? Like maybe 50K for 20%. And that's that's very, please don't think that's a standard that y'all should need to yeah. you know, like sit by. Making but shit up. I'm just making, yeah, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm making shit up that I know someone who've done, who's done that or whatever, whatever. Um but here's the thing. Being locked down really matters, right? And I know it doesn't seem like it because it is, again, it is more friendly than what existed before. But like I know an artist that uh, drops his song, song takes off, and they promise him so much money um, in marketing budget. Let me see. I think it was 30 or 40K, right? And then all this other money that will be will come after they drop the music video and things really get popping. Right. Mm-hmm. Let's say song drops in January, and his manager got into a combative moment with basically the label. Manager was kind of like flying off off the top. Ends up having a breakup with the manager, but then the manager says, "I still own." All this stuff where like he was he was playing some weird game with them and they end up being in court for six to eight months. Oh, damn. Yeah. And the label wouldn't do anything at all until they figured this whole situation out. So now he had a song that was pop popping moving. This is like SoundCloud, but it's moving crazy, ridiculous numbers. 
but now he can't drop the music video until 12 months later. Basically, it, get, it drops in the middle of December. Like nobody's checking for it. You know, you already know what December looks like yeah. as a month with zero marketing. And they made this entire, um, <laughs> they had this entire argument that it should be dropped on the specific YouTube page. And I told him, I, I told him the long, a lot, the whole way along that this shit didn't make sense. Like yeah. he dropped on a YouTube page that wasn't his, that wasn't popping itself. I'm sure that that was probably like their homie or something like that or whatever. Yeah. Like, so the strategy's all bad. So you can get caught up in a situation with a label, even if it's a short term agreement, where you end up following such bad advice, or they have such power over you that they manipulate your moves and they can suppress what you have going on. Maybe not intentionally. That's not what they're trying to do, but they're so worried about whatever their personal incentives are at the time, and for their strategy, you just get undercut. As like a stray, <laughs> you know, you catch a stray bullet, and there goes a, a huge moment in time. It could be a career. So, like I've seen this happen multiple times, like to artists, especially even with these short term like contracts, like and they fuck an artist up. And yeah. it sounds like, oh yeah, short term. That that's a great thing. Yeah, ten months is nice that it's a short term agreement per se, but in music. 10 months can be long too. Yeah, yeah, that's fact. That's fact. Like, it's, it's crazy. Um, let's see if there's one last comment that every label isn't bad, every label isn't good. Let's go with that. That one last statement. I'll say this it's all people. Always people. It's all people. Yeah. That's all it is. All right. So you might have some good people, you might have some bad people. And no, oh, here's another thing that happened in that time with that, that artist, the people he came in with. The entire organization got switched up. And that's they'll do it. That's a they'll risk. Do it. It's a high risk. They <laughs> wanted to change things up. There was a whole new guard. So now all these people who believed in you and saw you in the first place were no longer there. Those type of things happen. Right. So at the end of the day, it's people. He went from a good situation to a bad situation, literally because of the people. Um, and also the management situation and that legal people, right? So some people have a luck of the draw. Uh, some people are good in discernment, but however you can, praying, you know, rolling dice, <laughs> <laughs> blind luck, whatever it is, man, like try to find the right people you can in this industry. Part of the interruption, I have to take this quick commercial break to let you know that we are sponsored by me because I signed myself. We signed ourselves. This is Brand Man Network. That's why we're called No Labels Necessary because no label, nobody else is necessary for us to get the train moving. So if you could just subscribe to show appreciation, we'd really appreciate that. Back to the program. All right. Now, last topic, but this is our deep dive. We really want to get into this because we think it's going to be valuable for you. Y'all, when it comes to this new year, um, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Do you want streams for free? Be nice. You would like streams for free? It would, it would be nice. I think streams for free are a good thing. I would even say a great thing. And there's plenty of ways to get streams for free that are not scams. And that's what we're about to talk about right now. So let's get into it. The first way, matter of fact, I want to say this. Not only are we going to say the, th the ways to get streams for free that are not scams, but we're going to give you the deep dive within each topic on how we've gone about it, seen it, helped artists do it themselves so you can apply it for yourself. So make sure you stay all the way through because it's coming from real experience and, you know, it's free. Check this out. Corey, tell them why content is one of the top free breakdowns and how we will go about it going into 2023, yeah. right? Like today, not content that's, you know, you know that that's already been out there in the way people have been moving before. Yeah, yeah. I mean, content is the great equalizer because, I mean, one for the most part is it's relatively cheap to free, depending on your initial investment to be able to create the content, right? Like the equipment. Most of us got phones, so we have the ability to at least create something. You know what I'm saying? Even if it's not amazing, but I say it's a great equalizer because that one TikTok that you shot. Could hit a thousand new people, could hit a hundred thousand new people, right? And mm -hmm. so it has a chance to offset the cost of other things that you maybe would want to spend money on or even get you attention um, for free that you have to pay for. Great example 
is everybody watching this YouTube video right now, right? All this attention is free. We could have paid for it, but y'all are here because we put this podcast episode out, right? Mm -hmm. And so you need to be looking at your pieces of content the same. I am gathering people for free. I'm building people up for free. Um, Now, the way that we typically uh, explain to clients to go about it is one, just pick somewhere between one to three platforms to to focus on. Um, I think... I would say maybe two at least because I do think that one, there's just power in numbers. Um, two, you're able to learn a lot faster about cultural differences of platforms and things like that because you can compare it to stuff, right? Oh, they act this way when I post on YouTube versus when I post on my TikTok or whatever. So I do think that's important. And then, you know, we believe in like omnipresence building. So trying to hit the same person or group of people on a couple of different platforms and a couple of different places. So because of that, I say pick one to three platforms commit everything you can to just learning the ins and outs of those platforms, how the algorithm works, um, what content creators, not just music artists, but just content creators are doing on that platform in order to stay relevant and also what music artists are doing. I'm a firm believer in every platform you commit to, go find like three to five other artists who you just like the way they do things and just like study them and mm-hmm. like watch them and see if they're doing things that you could copy or emulate to some degree. That's the big thing right there. Mm-hmm. Find the people that you want to emulate yeah, yeah, because like they already figured out a lot of hard work, you know. Now you just come out behind and adding your own style and like characteristics to it. So, really big on that. And then the last thing we always tell them to do was like make sure you actually use the platform. Like use it at least like thirty minutes, maybe an hour a day. Scroll through TikTok, scroll through Twitter, whatever the platform you've chosen to to master is. You need to be using it pretty consistently because we talk about it a lot. There are a lot of times cultural things that you do in your content that determines whether or not it goes, not the content itself. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And in order for you to understand the people that you are culturally trying to tap into, you have to study the way they culturally move on the platform. You know what I'm saying? There's no getting around that. And the best way to do that, use the fucking platform, bro. You know what I mean? People I meet, I want to blow up on TikTok. Do you use TikTok? Hell no, I don't watch TikTok. So it's like, bro, you just, you just walking in this country language all confusing and even took the, the time out to try to speak it and you wondering why you can't order order some shit off the menu bro like you lost <laughs> bro you lost get your shit together so man, tiktok lame as fuck bro i don't want to use no tiktok <laughs> i don't want to use that shit bro <laughs> that shit ain't for me hey, so, but it's like you got to use it bro but literally we just start people there man pick pick a handful of platforms that you're going to commit to one to three like so i recommend at least two find some regular content creators that you can study Find some music artists who use that platform well that you can study and then just use that shit. Use the platform every day. 30 yeah. minutes to an hour at least just to get a feel for it. And I guess the fifth tip would be just start making shit. You know what I'm saying? Start experimenting because there are going to be a lot of things that we could say and maybe even other like social media gurus might be saying to you that won't really click for you until you start creating things and you, you get why we're saying what we're saying. Right? Oh, this is the reason the hook is important. Because I noticed my watch time keeps falling off in the first two seconds. Oh, that's why Sean keeps saying I need a hook on my videos to hold yeah. people's attention, right? Like, those are things that you don't understand until, like, you posted some content and you kind of see how things are moving. But it's like, that shit hits. Every piece of attention you get from it from then on out is free. Mm. And sometimes that attention can be massive. Facts, bro. Facts. Now, the emulation aspect of things. I want to mm. go back to when you talked about the fact that artists should find people they want to look at as an example on the platform. Yeah. Now, there's some specificity to that. And then there's one thing I want to add. Don't necessarily look for artists who are big on the platform because they're already a big name, a household name. They might be doing some cool stuff and it might be getting engagement, but they might be winning because they're already winning. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? So find somebody who's new and they're upcoming and you like what they're doing and there's things that you could pull from them because they're probably winning because they're good at using the platform, Yeah, which is very, very different, especially when you're starting up and all you're trying to do is trying to figure out how to use the platform again. And it's about what you like. You like how they're moving about it and you can see yourself doing the type of content that they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. Because you might not be somebody who's going to go outside and come up with these weird locations and shoot these beautiful shots or anything like that. You might just be a bedroom person. And so you're like, oh yeah, they're making the bedroom work. Or I like to move outside and I would keep doing that because I hate being in the house and, and just creating in this space. So maybe you like going and do different locations. So that's something you might want to do. All those things matter. And then besides other artists, just find other creators. 
yeah. that are doing shit that you feel like you can apply to yourself. So now, you know, you might not be able to do it exactly the same way because you want to figure out how to make it matter to an artist. All right. But you can still find that inspiration for, uh, from a couple. And I don't know if you said how many you would recommend that people. Like five or seven. Okay. It's, it's somewhere in there. Yeah. I would say seven max. Yeah. Seven max. Especially if you're talking about artists and non-artists. Yeah. And then the whole idea is to siphon the things from them that you would like to repeat. So that means you aren't taking anything wholly from anybody. Yeah. All right. I just need to find, oh, that one specific format, I like that they do that and they're winning with that format. This one specific format, I like that they do that. And then I want to flip that because the entire game when it comes to content is about stacking formats. It, TikTok really brought that to a head, but now people are copying it. So you know it's going to become more and more relevant on other platforms where you find a format that works and that format will kill. But that yeah. doesn't mean I could just drop any type of content now that that format will be the only thing that's doing well on your page and you're trying to figure out well should i only just do that now no you do that format you exploit the hell out of that format and that format might become the 80 percent that you're doing at the moment but formats don't last forever so you need to always be testing to find the next format in the mm -hmm. remaining 20 percent. so you got this 80 80 80 20, 20, 20. Oh, snap. I got a second format. So now I just had added a second format. And now I'm doing these two formats 80% of the time, possibly. All right. Or maybe it's like a 60, 20 between those two. But in the rest of it, I'm trying to find another format. Oh, snap. Now I got three formats. Experiment, experiment, experiment. Now I got four content formats that work. Oh, shit. One of them just died out. It's not doing good anymore, but I still got three left. Mm -hmm. Most people find themselves in a position where they got one, that format start popping. And then it dies and they don't know what to do. And they feel like, oh, my page just stopped working forever. And now I might need to start a completely new page because I'm shadow banned or something like mm -hmm. that. It's a life cycle that happens with these formats. And if you don't exploit formats, you probably don't even know why it worked in the first place. Mm -hmm. Right. So you need to start being able to understand why a format's working before you even maximize the platform to its fullest. So format stacking is a huge key in how you should look at your approach to your content as well. Yeah, yeah. And you asked too, like, what are we saying content-wise is going to carry over into 2023 and really scale? I mean, really the, the two things that I think are going to stick the most is just one, the emphasis on short-form content. Yes. Like TikTok has pretty much made that the new, the new, the new standard. The new normal, right? You said already, that. Need to find some old clips of us talking about that shit. Yeah, facts, bro. So it's like we got Instagram Reels, TikTok is TikTok. YouTube has blatantly come out and said, like, hey, we about to we about to focus on this shit and, and take over the game. And you know, whenever the giants are shifting their direction, the spillover is gonna hit everybody. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's like if they're emphasizing short form in such a way, trust and believe other platforms are also going to start emphasizing, which is why I argue, and I think you said before, like short form content is just the new content language. You know what I'm saying? Like, we got to all get used to it. So if you've been ducking it for the last year or two because you didn't want to make TikToks, 2023 and up is going to hurt. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So short form content being emphasized and then live stream. Like we talked about that briefly, right? Like TikTok has been making certain um, changes to the platform to emphasize live stream content. YouTube has been emphasizing it. Um, Twitch is Twitch. Um, Instagram has started adding certain tools to to their live streams to be able to make it more creative friendly. So I think 2023 is going to be the year we see like every platform try to compete for like the live streamer space. And the artists that can figure out how to take advantage of it is going to get that kind of like first movers advantage in the artist world that we were talking about. You don't have to, you won't be amazing to streamers, but in the artist world, you know <laughs> yeah. what I'm saying? Like you would be kind of like seen as like new. Which platforms are you most bullish on when it comes to live streaming for artists? TikTok and YouTube because Discovery is already built into it. Twitch to me is good for the artist that already has an audience and has a grasp on like how to push the audience over to Twitch. If you want to be able to stream, learn, you know what I'm saying, like how to be a good streamer and also potentially bring an audience in for it, yeah, that's going to be YouTube and TikTok. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I think that's going to be huge 
because live streaming is is great on TikTok. Like you said, the discoverability is there. Mm-hmm. I mean, people are literally going live and the live itself can be discovered. Mm-hmm. Same thing's happening on YouTube, right? You can go live and it pop up on somebody's homepage, right? Mm-hmm. Let alone all these other types of content that pull people to your page in the first place. So it's not just lives, which Twitch is. Instagram lives, eh, it's just not a threat, man. Like yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm nowhere um, near Instagram competing with those two yet. And I think lives, what people have to understand, are a great way to bring in money as well. Yeah. Right? So when you go live... There's so many people now in today's culture that are donating. That is the culture that has been building in America for the last, I don't know, 10 years slowly, maybe maybe a little bit longer than that, starting with Twitch, right? And this culture was over in Asia long before it really became a thing in, in America. So what you have now is a time where you can go live, make hella money. Matter of fact, the lead attorney, he's a YouTuber. This guy has the best breakdown of what I've seen when it comes to making money on YouTube live. When you stream, this dude does like five hour streams and just off rip, like talking. Dude's he's dope. He's hilarious. And he breaks it down scientifically. You know, a lot of people, they just do some shit, Mm -hmm. right? Or they'll just say some shit and it'll be some more inspirational. But he has a course, so y'all can go to his page. He's not getting paid or any affiliate for him, but the lead attorney. So he he actually was an attorney. I don't know if he still is, but he breaks down like there's all these elements where even giving appreciation to fans and people who donate you, how it creates more donations. Mm-hmm. And then the different um, types of appreciation and ways of addressing people who donate X amount of dollars versus another amount of dollars. There's all these small elements. And then he'll play it back of him doing it in real time, which is even crazier thing because you really have to be like good at it to like execute it in real time live. You know what I mean? It's one thing to be like, oh, theoretically, this is what you should do because this is going to make them more willing. And this is going to make them folks come around when you get a collection plate. It's going to, you know, you drop a little money in the collection plate at first. So then they see the money and now they're going to drop some money. You put a hundred in there. So now they're like, oh, people dropping hundreds. I might go ahead and do 10 instead of five. Right. Like there's that psychology and stuff that you can kind of dream up. But then when you see someone doing it live and they're actually implementing it, you know that they're a master and it's where people are masters um, at teaching and uh, executing. And I think like what I said, like in terms of seeing his course, he's one of the few people I've seen that have a quality course. So check out that dude's course because lives are only going to get bigger and bigger and Mm -hmm. bigger, like for real, for real. Um, And look, the money that people are making from it, (laughs) like this dude was making I think he got like 300k his first year on YouTube period Mm -hmm. and he was nowhere near the biggest YouTuber like and a lot of people this is a funny thing about uh, live too that's been interesting so people are not yet adjusted to it there's a lot of these YouTubers that we know that are big but the live game is not their game it actually is a different game right so how often do you see Mr. Beast go live I don't think he does does he does he? I haven't really seen. I'm sure he might have done it at one point in time, just like for a pop up thing. Like it's hard to imagine him not doing it. Yeah. But it's not his thing, right? Yeah. And there's so many other people who are not. That's just not their thing. So you got this guy sometimes being number one, right? When he has 100k subscribers, or even maybe even less than 100k subscribers at one point, being number one for the week in how much money he's made. On YouTube and all of YouTube, bro, all genres, yeah, right? That's crazy. But when you have the tactics right and you do it, it can go. And we're just in a space where that's going to become more and more and more and more of a thing. So um, content is great. Now, the second thing, though, when it comes to streaming for free, actually, last last thing on content, the beauty. If you want to sum up content, is today we post content and we get paid. Yep. Now, what are you trying to do in your content? You're marketing yourself. Good Lord. If you can market yourself and get paid for it, there's so many people, like just old school people, their mind, their brains will be broken by that concept. Yeah. Like, wait, what? 
I can get paid to market myself and then make money from that versus just throwing out a shit ton of money yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and then hoping to make my ROI back. It's ridiculous. So once you hit that scale and now you're getting paid, let's just make up a number. Let's just say $1,000 a month off of YouTube. Like be super reasonable. Yeah. You're getting paid $1,000 to try to convince people to pay, to, to help you make $50,000. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like that concept is crazy, but it's real. That is what YouTube is about. So content is beautiful. It unlocks everything in that regard now the second thing that we jotted down was communities oh yeah right yeah. um now when it comes to communities there's two ways to say it so we could talk about the community like starting a community and we could talk about communities in terms of the communities that you can hijack and get into and i think the second one is far more important at this point all right because we're talking about growth yeah. so the first thing is if y'all saw our episode number 17 where we talk about overrated music marketing tactics yeah. trying to start a community before you have a legit fan base overrated don't do it so we're gonna keep that short but i would love to hear you talk about communities from a standpoint of the platforms and how to use them so we know that discord uh reddit, reddit yeah my YouTube has its own um, segment of communities. There's all these communities that exist, but let's kind of dig deep into those so people can understand how communities are so powerful, but how you can use them in a free way to get to um, back to your own music and streams. Yeah, yeah. So I, I look at communities as free, well, usually well put together parts of uh, potential listeners for you, right? Depending on the type of music you make. Mm. So when I think about communities, the, the the ones I do think about the most are Reddit, um, Discord, and then I consider the comment section of certain like influencer and influencer accounts to be like their own communities. Mm -hmm. If you've ever looked at, uh, let's say, like a DJ Academics comments and you scroll through it, like that feels like a community. You know what I'm saying? Like it's, yes. it's people interacting with each other and all under the guise of DJ Academics. So I do consider those, those comment sections to be in the same umbrella. So the way that you use these communities and I'm just going to keep it Discord and Reddit because it's the easier to map it to. But the way you use these communities is, one, it all goes about the research. Like, find ones that actually speak to your demographic, right? I think artists have a really bad habit of assuming that if there's a community of music listeners, they all like your music. It's not true, right? Mm -hmm. I, as a rapper, could go into fucking a country artist Discord group and if I post my shit, they get me the fuck out of there. Out. You know out and vice versa bro if that country artist came into like Kodak Black Discord group promoting his, his music they getting that motherfucker out. they might laugh at him and get that motherfucker out yeah. there, right so like make sure you're actually looking into and researching communities that you feel like embody the type of people that you're looking to go after or you think will like your type of music so once you found those spaces and you know what those spaces look like the next step is easy bro it's just engage in the community and this is, but this is the step where I think most artists fuck up, right? I find, I as an artist find a Discord group. Oh shit, Kenny Beats got a Discord group. It's, it's 20,000 people in here right now. I'm just going to drop a link and tell everybody to go check it out. You know what's going to happen? One, if they got a good mod system, they're getting you the fuck out of there. Yep. <laughs> hey, same for our community. People oh, come yeah. in for the music and drop, try to drop music and get people to listen. That's not what it's for. Yeah, if you're bro. thinking about getting in Brand Man Network, brandmannetwork.com, check it out. It's, it's like, yeah. It's like, get out of here, you vulture, you leech. Yes. You know what I'm saying? And so the, the, they're going to get you out of there. But then, then the community has lost trust and respect in you because you are a person that tried to come into this community space and siphon value yep. before you presented any type of value back. And so that's the part of community interacting why I think most artists fuck up. Your natural instinct is, oh, this shit hard. There's a lot of people in here. Let me let me let everybody know about this shit. Whereas like your first real instinct should be, hey, here's this community of people. How can I build their trust? What type of value can I bring into this community space that can build their trust up? And that changes from space to space. But sometimes it's as simple as just interacting in conversations that the community is already having. Are oh, you just... You join and they were talking about what's their favorite anime out, bro. Go and drop your favorite anime and join the conversation, right? Like, don't be the guy that comes and says, like, hey, guys, I know y'all were talking about this shit, but my album just came out. You know what I'm saying? Y'all should go. Y'all should go get into that because they're not going to respond well to it. But yep. the easiest way to bring value to the community is to engage and interact with things that the community has already been building value around. You know what I'm saying? Man, look, you mentioned something that made me want to pull up 
a clip from Vlad TV, right? Now, why do I want to pull up a Vlad TV clip? All I did was go to YouTube, search oh. Vlad TV. Now, the reason I pulled up this is because if you go to Vlad TV, you type it on YouTube, look at the first couple of videos, start scrolling down. Eventually, you're going to see a comment from none other than TK Kirkland. And the crazy part about that is this guy is a comedian. And if you watch Vlad TV and you look at Vlad's comments, you will know he's in video all after of video. All of these comments, bro. Comment and comment and comment. So much so, you will see people in the comments saying, here before TK. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or sometimes saying, TK will say it. He literally made himself a face within this community, literally just by being someone who's commenting on all the videos. However, let's be clear. We want to talk value, right? Ja'Cory mentioned value. You can't just be talking about anything, yeah. right? You, he's not here trying to drop his music or saying, go check out my comedy special or nothing like that, right? What did he say in this particular video? I told the marketing team, don't scare the audience into not eating Taco Bell by hiring Big Perm. <laughs> Get some slim, attractive actors to do the commercial to fool people. Now, context. <laughs> this The whole clip is about Faze on Love. They told me because I'm fat, I can't do a Taco Bell commercial, right? So he's talking about him like he's making a joke. Mm -hmm. And that's his thing. Again, he's a comedian. So adding value for him is, one, of course, being funny. Yep. But two, making these comments consistently and they're contextual. It's yep. not just some random knock-knock joke in the comments. It's contextual to the videos, right? Yep. yep. All right? So let's see what I want. What these comments to him and say. See, go to sleep, TK. Like, people already know who he is and they're like, stop just because, right? They've seen him so much. Let's see. 10 years from now, I can envision this man still writing these cheap, I told you so, and so, and to do it, such and such, blah, blah, blah. Okay, type comments. So, under the TK handle. This person is basically addressing how long TK has already been yeah. making comments, and I can see this dude doing it forever. Sounds like he's trying to, like, roast him a little bit, but the point is, it worked, right? Yeah. That's all that matters. You've gotten out of obscurity by doing it again and again. All he did was comment on a lot of stuff. So maybe there's some somebody's uh, YouTube page that you watch a lot. Might want to comment on yeah, it. Comment, bro. A lot until people recognize you. It's like that one dude on Instagram, bro. Could I cannot, be ours, by the way. I cannot. You said what? I said, oh, could, be yeah, could be ours. Yeah, yeah, drop a comment. Up. Drop a like. It's a dude on Instagram that does the same thing, bro. I cannot think of his name, but he'd be like an all the rap blog page comments. I cannot think of his name, bro. Is it? Is it DJ Flip? Maybe, maybe not DJ Flip. There was a producer who did that a while ago too. I did. Uh, yeah, he was on Twitter though. Okay, man, but yeah, they be yeah, everywhere, bro. It's always yeah. one per platform, like doing that shit. Mm -hmm. But it's like, like you said, like just having that visibility in the community says a lot. Great example. Bring it back to music artists. While I was like six nine DJ Academics community, right? Like he's always in the comments. He's always, you know, what I'm saying responding and engaging. It's like you know who that artist is. You're aware of him, like it's like it's like a, a free pop up in a sense, right? To see him in the comments. Mm -hmm. um, so even just like engaging on certain stuff, and this is a little bit outside of the context of what we're talking about, because I do think that works more for artists as they get a fan base. But even just engaging and leaving your opinions on things like will start to help you grow at some point, right? Because yep. we're so intrigued with wanting to know what our favorite entertainers think about, even like little shit, bro, like like that. You know what I'm saying, like I want to know what. TK thought about the the, the phase on love Taco Bell commercial thing, but That's it. yeah, but the best way to bring value to any community is to just come and engage in the things that they're already talking about, because that is where the value currently lies. You know what I'm saying? For that community in particular, and so once you've built the trust of the community, you've interacted for a while. Yeah, now you can start dropping your music and you know and, and asking for feedback in certain ways. Most communities tend to have a space for that anyway, but the difference between the people who get listened to. And the people who don't get listened to are the ones that get listened to provided value to the community to where people are listening, not even because they necessarily think you're going to be amazing or not, but because they just fuck with you. That's it. <laughs> That's it. And that goes such a long way, bro. Hey, I fuck with you, bro. So, yeah, I go check out your new song that you want feedback on. Right. And mm -hmm. so, like, you do that enough and you build up enough trust and enough. Um, Reddit is important, but Reddit won't even some threads won't even let you like post promo clips without building up a certain amount of points, right? You got to prove the Reddit that you want this shit to engage and be a part of the community, not just spam promo and dip, you know? That's right. And so 
as you build up enough trust in these different communities, you give yourself the leeway, you give future you the ability to be spammy and promotional in these communities with an actual return on it. Mm-hmm. Being promotional and spammy in the beginning, that's the complete opposite. You're killing off future you. The first time you might get some people that click over, right? Okay, maybe you call somebody, somebody else was new, not really know that you ain't been here doing shit. Or just call some people in a, in, a, in a good mood. But the more you keep doing that, the more people are going to just look and say, hey, this person only ever comments when they want me to do some shit. They're not really here taking part in the community. So I'm never going to listen to what such and such wants me to listen to. Again, you're hurting future you versus if you had just took a couple, you know, post your first 10, 20 days in the community. You know what I'm saying? Just hang out in there and just talk, bro. Just be- become one with the yes. space. If you, time. if you were to truly sit down and do that, bro, from that point on out, you could damn it draw whatever you want to draw and people would be more likely to check it out because they know you and like you at that point. You become a face yep. in that community, in that space. So That's yeah. right. And something that goes hand in hand with community that also adds to a free way to market yourself is networking. Yep. All right. Yep. Network, network, network. Now, the beauty of network, right? Like Jacory said, you get people to fuck with you, then they'll support you. Yep. Just off of the strength of fucking with you. Matter of fact, your king. My king? Yes, your king. My king? <laughs> oh, it's my uh, Lil Yachty? Lil Yachty. <laughs> <laughs> Something he said early on was, I just got a bunch of influencers to fuck with me. And that was at a time when people weren't as game on influencers mm-hmm. and all that stuff. But he got cool influencers and taste pe- makers to fuck with him. And then they supported him. And obviously that helped create a career and image that he could capitalize off of. Right? Yeah. yeah. Same thing still applies today. It might not move as quickly because the, the game is a little bit more saturated. Um, influencers are a little bit more cognizant of what they post and should they get paid for it or not, da da da. But still, getting people to support you just by building direct relationship, and that's some real world stuff. It's harder to do that sometimes for some people, but then you also could do it online. But once you do that, then it still shows. Honestly, still a huge part of the game, right? It's just having a large amount of people rock with you yeah all right you know, yeah, i'm yeah. talking about on the industry side the friends and, and family and and friends of friends and business uh, associate side not the fans that's obvious right just having those people fuck with you and getting that support is what helps you stay in the game yeah yeah no, i agree and i mean like you already said networking is free bro it's free to shoot off a dm it's free to you walk know? up to somebody at a event well i guess you have to pay to get into the event but you know beyond that it's free to walk <laughs> up to them and talk to them yeah and you just never know, like, what a relationship can turn into. Yeah. And even to the, the credit of the Lil Yachty thing, I, I would I would make the argument that now, because there are so many, so much more influencers than there were back then, like, the likelihood of that happening is a lot higher now. You know what I'm saying? Maybe not to the degree, because back then it was, like, yeah. it'd be, like, a handful of influencers, and they all had, like, real, like, impact on the platform. Right, right. now it's, like, a bunch of impl- influencers with a smaller impact on the platform. But it's more than that you, that you could get in contact with, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. to make things happen but yeah man like that's one of the most underrated superpowers in the music industry is getting people to like you and fuck with you you know what i'm saying like and the ones that you see that are able to do that really well and they have good music like they they just grow you know what i'm saying because it's like the word of mouth factor kicks in like really quickly it's like oh yo i mean i've, I've been in the shows before where i meet an artist and like he's nice or something you know what i'm saying cool guy cool girl and we chop it up, and then later I go listen to that music, and I'm thinking about that while listening. Like, damn, that dude was cool, and this shit is fire. Yeah, I'll play it a couple more times. I Man, I go put people yep. onto it, right? Like, you you naturally, people naturally want to do things for people that they like, right? Like, you just, it's just something in you just like forces you, forces you to do it. That's it. And so, it's like, the more of these people you network with that you get to like you, the more they just start like doing things for you without you even asking for it. You know what I'm saying? Like, that artist didn't ask yeah. me to put my friends on, but I did it, you know? Cause I was like, bro, you cool, bro. Dog, people will witness some type of scandal mm-hmm. publicly and they will say, oh, well, you know, I met the person and they were a nice guy. They were a nice girl. Mm-hmm. Right. But they just met him one time. Mm-hmm. And that positive interaction that they had with him that one time because they didn't act like a higher than thou celebrity or something. And they were so cool that one time makes it difficult for them to just hop on the bandwagon yeah. of, you know, whatever scandal is going on at the moment. Yeah, bro. Got him ignoring the head in the freezer. Got him ignoring <laughs> the head in the freezer. <laughs> my head, my mind was someone else, but we're going to go straight to the next one. Collaborations. <laughs> Artists, producers, influencers, you can collaborate with so many different people and it goes hand in hand with the, the networking 
but obviously it's y'all doing it together. There's nothing like like collaborating and giving a little, right? And getting a little in return. Yeah. Right? I yeah. think that's the beauty of collaborations. Yeah, but I think we got to give context with this one. Artists on your level are slightly higher because if they're too much higher, it's not going to be free. Yes, 100%. Yeah, yeah. So they got to be, uh, what is it, yeah. horizontal or like slightly vertical? Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Like you got 20,000, they got 30,000 monthly listeners. Yeah. Because you know this is a free list. This yeah. is a free list, right? Yeah. And of course, you want to do those collaborations with people who are, who are relevant and we're talking about artists, right? Yeah. yeah. And you want to be able to do it to the extent that you can use the feature feature on Spotify so you actually have access to their audience, not you just have their name in the title so you can try to cap off of their name and you still have to spend money to market it. No, you want to leverage their audience and you can literally build relationship after relationship with artists who have audiences and that's all of your marketing and you just do that mm -hmm. over and over again. Yeah. Now you have to be good at building relationships. It's harder to do this if your music is only but so good. All right? So... You know, put in some more work in such, that kitchen. Such as all of this. You know, all of this is. <laughs> facts, facts. So 100% artist collaborations. But, of course, you might not want to work with a billion artists every single year. We get that, that there's difficulty. But that is a very valid route and a very strong strategy that we've seen multiple people use um, or been a part of people using where they strate strategically say, I'm going to do a bunch of collaborations mm -hmm. this year and watch my numbers go up. It yeah. works. Yeah. It works. So like front end, you get the attachment to the other artists, and then back end, you got this whole new group of people that fuck with you, That's right? It. For, for whatever reason. So, yeah. That's it. Collaboration is super underrated. And mm -hmm. I, I think, too, it's a good way to kind of like train the algorithms around you, kind of oh, give them an idea way. of great like who, way. what mm -hmm. direction they should be pushing you in. Yep. And it's like stock, bro. It's like if you go collab with 10 artists and three of them take off, all that's coming back to you. You know what I'm saying? In one way or another. Yep. So, uh, yeah, collaboration is super underrated. Grow, grow strategy. Too yep. many artists want to be. Just me, like I did this. Just it's me, so, me, me. It's, yeah. it's weird to me. I, I get wanting to be dope at your craft and have credit for that, but especially people who have enough of it out, where it's like, yeah, we get it. You can yeah. do your thing. I don't understand the not collaborating. Yeah, thing. bro. It's like even Michael Jordan had to pass the ball, bro. You know what I'm saying? Pass the ball. Like, every now and again, yeah. you got to pass the ball. I think that's a great analogy, man. Yeah, man. That's Thank a, you. Appreciate that. That's it's, a good one right there. Can't me on the spot. I appreciate hey, that, man. man. <laughs> 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 influencers also are on this list um, as people to collaborate with. And it's a little bit different, obviously. Yeah. The trade isn't exactly the same. You might have to judge them a little differently um, in terms of their following on whether they'll be willing to respond to you because you might not have, you know, 100K followers, but still might be able to land 100K influencer for free. The networking is a little differently. Um, but one again starting with good music and having a concept that might bid well for them mm. um but i think it goes it's interesting because when we're talking about that type of content it has to really really make sense mm. usually for the other person like why am i doing this idea and we might collaborate from a standpoint of we're in the video together but maybe i'm not the person posting it on my platform yeah. Right. There's different ways to do it. Or you. Here's a great way I've seen influencer collaborations approached. I go to your house. You go to my house. Right. And when I'm in your house, I eat your food. You in my house, you eat my food. And what I mean by that is. I go to your house on your influencer page. You're the influencer. I'm going to fall into your vibe. So I might not be there as the artist. Mm. All right. I'm just somebody who's having fun with you or executing this idea that fits your specific audience. Yep, right. Yep. And then when they come in my page, I might work them into something musical, whether it's as a porter or some something that makes sense. Right. Yeah. The benefit is it's almost like a cameo of this artist. It's like when Biggie Smalls and Snoop Dogg were on Martin back in the day. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like you're there. You get this cameo effect. But you're not even pushing your music, which in a sense almost begins to start making you feel even bigger over time mm -hmm. because you're so important that you can be in places and not have nothing to do with the thing that you're selling. That's how it begins to be perceived over time. So if you if you do an influencer collaboration, don't be afraid to do something that's not music, particularly when it's on their page. And also knowing that you don't have to limit who you reach out to or who you can collaborate with based on whether you feel like they're willing to do 
some of your music on on their page specifically or if it makes sense for your music specifically there's a lot of ways to tweak it yeah yeah i agree i percent agree now what if you're not in a music entertainment type of city in terms of collaborations what are your thoughts but the internet bro internet. instagram tiktok discord you know what i'm saying the internet bro the internet's killed all, all that off bro like i've like for a long time, I've been seeing kids in Atlanta collaborate with kids in Sweden, and Denmark, and New Zealand, and shit like that. You know what I'm saying? So I think the the barrier has been crossed. Now you can make the argument for events and things like that, right? More conferences come to Atlanta and LA than come to probably like Milwaukee or something like that, right? You know, like that that is an argument in itself. But one, I, I think that goes back to just the content aspect of it. If you build your online persona, it is easier for you to network online. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, over the last X amount of years, I would say at least 60% of my network has come from motherfuckers I just met off the internet. You know what I'm saying? At least 60%. Right. If I'm being completely honest. And that came through the persona being built up, right? So I think that if you are doing the content stuff, it will be easier for you to network online. People will trust you a little bit more. There will be people that have seen you that you just didn't know were aware of you. Um, and it becomes easier to kind of like flip that. But yeah, outside of that, man, it's like, I, yeah, bro, you can network with anybody anywhere at this point. That whole excuse in my head is, is gone, like 100% gone. Hey, I agree. It's that simple for me. Now, the last thing um, is shows, right? Shows, That's yeah. what we have listed. And shows are a little different, right? Because yeah. doing them for free, if you're hopping on somebody's showcase, right? Yep. You know what I mean? That works for for free, um, cheap, right? You could hop on a showcase with people that you know or whatever, or create something with people you know. Yep. So then now all the artists pitch in less money, and now y'all have this visibility because y'all also pull y'all's resources and friends together. Maybe there's something like that, and that's cool. Not only in the city, the physical presence, but if you can then translate that online because now they're all sharing you and your face and y'all work out a way that it actually translates well yep. right like hey we are going to share each other's uh, music every day for this week right and help each other so let's just say there's seven artists we're going to do a, sh a show with the showcase of seven artists and yeah we're everybody's going to bring out all their friends but also as a part of the marketing campaign we're going to invite people to the show by introducing a new artist every single day and show their music. Or we're going to introduce a flyer with everybody, but we're still going to show and highlight an artist every single day from this. And you're one of them. Right. And now y'all are sharing that online. So you got an extended reach beyond the people who can actually show up physically. Like Little things like that, when you're early on, they make a big difference. Um, I don't know if you have anything for shows but i think that's a, a a perfect segue to the fact that the expectations are different right yeah. when we talk about all of these free methods or super super cheap methods if you're not spending a lot of money you're probably gonna have to spend more time yeah. all right but be patient that's a part of the process and it's a part of that momentum all right so you will build slowly one plus one Plus one, plus one, plus one, plus two, plus two, plus three, plus three, plus five, plus five, plus five. Then next thing you know, you at plus 100 and then you start multiplying, right? Mm -hmm. That's the way you have to look at it, but you have to have faith to, to move into it that long. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I mean, the only thing I, I guess I would have to add to the show thing is um, don't ignore the small upcoming promoter. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Get cool with that guy. Yes. Go to other artist shows, bro. Artists be so weird about going to other artist shows. And it's like, how are you going to meet the people putting these shows together if you're not going to support other artists? Yes, because you can't do it while you're on stage at your show. Exactly, exactly. Right. Great point. Right. So it's like, go to other artist shows, man. Like this, and this could also tie back to where you are. But if you're in any type of city that has a music scene or a music culture and, and they're underground arts performer, there isn't a reason why you shouldn't be going to at least like one show a week. You know what I'm saying? Like something, bro, like just to keep yourself in the atmosphere and kind of see who are the power players and or who you maybe even just need to kind of like sort of pay attention to that could put you on the show at some point. Yep. So yeah, that's really all I got to add to it. No, yeah, you, you said everything goes. But, but yeah. well, well, look, those are some of the methods that you can build your fan base for completely free, especially if you're building from ground zero. Yep. And again, these things will compound over time. And even when you have money, 
You can still do them for free and they help. They'll just work even better. Yep. And when you get money, you can actually invest money behind some of these things to just amplify their impact for a less physical effort. So these things work all the way around. Um, they're super relevant. Hopefully y'all got value from this podcast today. Make sure you like, subscribe, share this thing. I didn't mention before, but we will mention it in the future. We are going to get to 1 million subscribers. Yep. We're only at 123,000 right now, but we set our sights on, a, on 1 million subscribers and we're serious about it. We're happy that y'all are along for the journey, but don't keep this sauce to yourself. Share it with your fam, your friends, and whoever so we can get there. Yep. That's all I ask. I'm Brandman Sean. I'm Corey. And we out. Peace.